Hello everybody, welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host Ricardo Lopes and today I'm joined by Dr. Robert Sapolsky. He is the John A. and Cynthia Freigen Professor of Biology and Professor of Neurology and of Neurosurgery at Stanford University. He is a renowned researcher and award-winning professor and is also the author of books like Why Zebras Don't Get Ulcers, The Trouble with Testosterone, um, and Primate's Memoir, and more recently, Behave, the Biology of Humans at Our Best and Worst. So, Dr. Sapolsky, thank you a lot for taking the time to come on the show. It's an honor to have you on. Sure, delighted. Thanks for the invitation. <laughs> okay, it's my pleasure. So, uh, the first question I would like to ask you, and because I went through all of your uh, YouTube classes on the biology of human behavior or something like that uh, at the course that you have uh, at Stanford University, I guess. Um, I, I would like to ask you, because you talk there about the fact that we have to be careful when thinking about human behavior and the different buckets, the different disciplines that we have to approach it, uh, just to not be inside a box while thinking about it. But uh, when you think about the different boxes, let's say, and how they are connected to each other. Do you have a sort of a emergentistic or a reductionistic approach to human behavior? I mean, do you think that uh, things emerge from activity at lower levels or, the, uh, uh, and, or do you think that we can explain what happens, for example, at a mental level from brain activity or something like that? Great. This is, in effect, one of the central problems in sort of neuroscience these days, understanding the brain. We got a pretty good idea how things work on the level of cells, even molecules. We've got a good sense of how things work on the level of entire parts of the brain that will contain a billion neurons, even circuits in it. We just don't have a good science for how you go from one cell at a time to 10,000 cells that constitute a memory circuit, that constitute a bias, that constitute a conditioned fear, things like that. That jump is really difficult. Um, in the face of it, um, sort of if you're a, a nuts and bolts neurobiologist, as I was raised to be, um, your bias is, let's just get more and more reductive. The way you understand a complex system is to break it into its component parts, and once you understand everything you can imagine about each component part, just add the pieces up together, and you understand the complex system. And what's clear is if you want to understand anything complicated, like a neuron, or a person, or a society, Instead, the nonlinear emergent properties are just so much more important and so much more interesting, and we simply don't have good enough of a science yet for how to get at it. Mm -hmm. So, talking about the ultimate level of explanation of human behavior and things like, for example, evolutionary psychology, I mean, uh, I think that you are an advocate of group selection, biological group selection. Is that correct? Well, I was, I was raised to, to just shudder and, and get embarrassed at the very notion that there is group selection and that you might not be like condemning it forcefully. The 1960s version of group selection was nonsense, that organisms behave for the group of the species. Um, the modern version, neo-group selection, um, although a few people argue that it's not so neo, it's just a more sensible version of the ancient one, um, but modern group selection basically can be summarized as there's circumstances where an individual with trait A <coughs> sorry, will outcompete an individual with trait B. However, there are circumstances where a group of individuals with trait B will outcompete a group of individuals with, tra with tra uh, trait A. Um, in other words, circumstances of cooperation, of emergent forces, of mass action, things of that sort. 
that are deleterious on the level of one individual at a time, but are spectacular in the group level. And those are relatively rare circumstances uh, when that emerges, and those are relatively rare circumstances where selection is so powerful at that group level, but those relatively rare circumstances are the ones you're finding in humans that they're most interesting. So I'm not a group selectionist, I'm, I'm a multi-level selectionist, but um, amid that, yeah, selfish gene, selfish genome, selfish promoter sequences on DNA, emergent neo-group selection properties are so interesting. <laughs> yeah, I understand. And since you are an advocate of multi-level selection, what do you think about the proposal coming from certain people like David Sloan Wilson and the philosopher Massimo Pigliucci uh, about the extended evolutionary synthesis in biology or, or in uh, evolutionary biology? Because the people nowadays are saying, or at least some of them, that we have also to expand and include things like epigenetics and culture and language and symbolism and other things like that. So what do you think about that proposal? That's a totally valid level. I mean, epigenetics is turning out to be pretty important in explaining why one adult lab rat is more neurotic or more healthy or more capable of learning during stress or more pro-social or more of a jerk than the next lab rat, um, it's turning out to be hugely explanatory with humans. And in some ways, by the time you get to us, um, the most interesting thing about our genetics is the extent to which we have evolved to be free of genetic determinism. Um, the extent to which we evolved that our genes are so much less important evolutionarily than the evolution of the regulation of those genes. And all of those re aspects of regulation, they're all environmental dependent. They're all context dependent. That's just hugely important. So in that regard, contextual gene regulation is so much more important in humans than the genes themselves. Mm -hmm. And you are including in this regulation also genes that uh, are behind our psychology and our psychological traits and our behavior, right? I'm, I'm asking you this because uh, a couple of months ago or so I had on the show uh, Kevin Mitchell and he published a recent book Innate and he argues there and also in his blog, on his blog that uh, at least psychological or epigenetics is not is still not really solid in terms of the results and the replica and the the replication and, and things like that so it's it's a new discipline it's one that just begs for people to over oversell it and over hype it and it's got to be completely uh sort of careful in that regard but just one one single thing sort of encapsulates that, which is as you look at more complicated organisms with larger genomes, the larger the genome, the greater the percentage of it is devoted to regulatory elements. Mm -hmm. In other words, if you want to evolve being complex, it's not about the genes, it's about more and more promoters and regulatory sequences and cisgenic and transgenic regulatory factors and things of that sort. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't get too excited about sort of epigenetics explaining everything on earth, but it's incredibly important. One of the, one of the criticisms of epigenetics is, or just the whole notion, the larger notion of context dependent gene regulation is okay, hooray, you have just shown that if you manage to grow this desert cactus in the middle of the Amazon, um, its gene expression profile is going to be different than where it usually comes from. Wow, isn't that interesting? But you know what? There's not a whole lot of cacti growing in the middle of the Amazon, and there's not a whole lot of Amazonian lizards that are living in Antarctica. There's yeah, 
potentially an extremely different environment. You get extremely different pictures of gene regulation. And, okay, that's fascinating, but not terribly relevant to most species until you get to us. Because we live in the Amazon and in desert and in tundra and in capitalist societies and socialist ones and polygamists and monogamist and hunter gatherers and horticulturalists, etc., etc. Um, there's no species in which the rule that the more varied the environment, the less genetic determinism and the more genetic regulation environmentally dependent is going to be critical. We're, we're the poster children for that. Um, and that, that has to be factored into any consideration of humans. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, and so, um, since we are talking about epigenetics and other mechanisms that might uh, environmentally alter uh, the way our genes get expressed and maybe some of our psychological traits, uh, do you think that it makes sense for us to talk about uh, a human nature that is a set of psychological traits in this case that characterizes humans in general because we are exposed to all of these different sorts of factors sure. and influences? Um, well, the thing that is most striking about humans is how we're simultaneously the most miserably violent species on the planet and the most altruistic and cooperative. And the most startling thing of all is how sometimes that full range of variability can be shown by the same individual human, mm -hmm. depending on their setting, depending on context, all of that. Whatever human nature is about, it's about enormous malleability, enormous pliability. One of the best examples I could think of of how to sort of frame that is when it comes to humans doing something that virtually every social primate out there does, virtually every social mammal does, um, even further than that, which is to automatically divide the world into us and them. Um, us, the member of my immediate family, us, the member of my band, my social group, my baboon troop, so on. Uh, to divide the world into us and them. Like every other species out there that has been studied, we do it in a fraction of a section. second. We do it implicitly. We do it with a brain circuitry that a baboon does, involving areas like the amygdala, areas like the insular cortex, areas having to do with fear and anxiety and disgust and aggression. We do it in a fraction of a second, and what is absolutely, I think, in our human nature is to not like the thems and be a whole lot more comfortable with the us's and for it to take much less of a provocation to elicit aggression against the thems, against us's. I think we are absolutely hardwired to divide the world into us and them, and unless you're the Dalai Lama, that's virtually guaranteed in human nature. But at the same time, it is spectacularly easy for us as humans to be manipulated into who counts as an us and who counts as a them. And unlike any other primate out there, we have multiple categories of us's and them's in our heads. And which one is most important comes to the forefront in a fraction of a second. And the person who, you know, if you're walking down a street at night, and it's dark and it's deserted and here comes a young male example of one of them and it's a them it's a them is screaming in your head like crazy the knowledge that if instead you were sitting next to them in a football stadium and both of you were like cheering the same stupid idiotic chant in favor of the same team you'd you give up your life for this brother of your sort of thing context dependency. Who is a them? We've got multiple categories in our heads. Who counts as a them could change in a second. And incredibly moving examples from war, from things like that, show us that that could happen under the most extreme, unlikely human circumstances. That can happen in our everyday lives as well. Mm -hmm. 
and that includes things like empathy, right? And how it works, because I guess that we would then feel much more empathy toward people that are part of our uh, in-groups, let's say, than our out-groups, correct? Sure, and we come with some very strong cases of prepared learning as to who is going to count as an in-group. Um, and it is so much easier to feel empathy for someone whose face is like yours, whose problems are familiar, who is local rather than on the other side of some psychological planet. Um, yeah, it's much, much easier. We have predispositions towards that. I think it is inevitable that we have some predispositions along lines of race and gender and age and all sorts of markers that we have of socioeconomic status, things of that sort, but none of them are inevitable. And amid those predispositions, there's remarkable studies showing that you recategorize people in a second time as to who counts as an us or them. And some of the time, that's like the greatest teaching tool of the worst ideologues and fascists and propagandists on earth. And some of the time, that's our greatest hope. Mm -hmm. Right. And since we are touching here on, on human morality, uh, I guess that another question would be, so there are these aspects to our psychology, like the us them divide that we are sort of hardwired to follow but then there are also other more specific aspects of morality like for example referring to jonathan Haidt's moral foundations and that in uh, the fact that different groups of people with different genetic predispositions i guess and even individuals uh, uh, have different, uh, let's say, taste buds for morality, and then that's another source of conflict between humans, right? Sure. However, if you pointed a gun at my head and said, okay, you got to choose between gene and environment, okay, okay, we know you really don't have to do that because genes and environment interact and they're... they're inseparable and it's fascinating and it's wonderful and isn't modern science great nonetheless if you framed it instead as you can only find out one fact about this person and the fact can either be their genome or their developmental history starting with when they were a fetus you can only find out one which one do you want to know to have more predictive power I think absolutely developmental history I think that's far more powerful. Um, and again, development manifests itself insofar as it works on our genetic underpinnings, blah, blah, etc. But when one looks at these variables, you know, let's not have to choose, but if you had to, developmental aspects I think are far more important. Mm -hmm. So, in terms of the nature-nurture debate, you would call yourself an interactionist? Right? Absolutely, yeah. Um, where it doesn't even make sense to ask what a gene does, only what it does in a particular environment. You want to look at a boring gene, yeah, you know, you got the gene for Huntington's Korea, and it really doesn't matter if you're raised as a polytheistic hunter-gatherer or if you were raised as a, you know, robber baron capitalist or anything. Your brain is going to have horrible neurological problems by the time you're about 40 years old. Yeah, genetic determinism that's a pretty dramatic case of it there um, nonetheless for all the interesting stuff it's it's totally interactive and with that comes a caveat which is incredibly important when you get to stuff like behavior genetics and superb cutting-edge studies that will say aha we've just looked at 200,000 people and 
sequence with genome-wide association surveys, their entire genomes, and millions of variable hotspots in their genomes, and we've like sacrificed the life of a thousand bioinformatics scientists to get all these answers, and here is the heritability of this particular trait. And what has to be remembered is that's not what you're saying. You're saying here is the heritability of this trait in the environments in which we have studied it to that extent so far. And that has to be remembered. And the lesson of humans over and over again is study this in some other environment and you can get a drastically different answer. Mm -hmm. And also it usually only applies to a specific population, that is, it only explains the variation among individuals within a given population, right? Absolutely. So this is the heritability of the individuals we have studied in the environments we've examined it in with their particular histories. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So let me ask you about a big topic that you also cover in your work, particularly in your uh, latest book, uh, the topic of free will, because this is a very controversial one. And I guess that you would say that you don't think free will exists. Is that correct? Or? Yeah, if, if I want to be polite and not be a sort of an unwelcome house guest who is like two in your face um, I would say all we've been learning for the last 200 years is more and more things that we used to attribute to this nebulous concept of free will we instead at some point have to st sit up and say oh I had no idea that was biological and if you want to believe in free will, you have to admit that it's getting more and more crowded into tiny spaces and spaces that are not very interesting. And if you want to insist that it's free will that this morning you brushed your upper teeth before your lower teeth instead of the other way around, you know, you want to attribute that to free will, go ahead, be happy, you know, whatever. Um, I personally think there is no free will whatsoever, that it is impossible to make sense of anything that we do or think or feel or remember or hope for or any such thing out of the context of the neurobiology that went on one second ago and the environmental triggers of that neurobiology that went on one minute ago and the hormone levels you were exposed to this morning and the neuroplasticity over recent months and your adolescence and your childhood and the epigenetics of your fetal life and your genes and the culture that your ancestors came up with and the ecosystems that made those cultures and millions of years of evolution you can't we are nothing more or less than the sum of all of those biological factors that have made us who we are in this instance. And what we call free will is simply the biology that we haven't understood well enough yet. Mm -hmm. So not even our well-developed uh, human prefrontal cortices would help there, right? There, there's no better example of it than that in terms of the one we have had so little to do with like this notion of there's a little homunculus, there's a little man up there <clears throat> inside our heads or a woman who, yeah, they read the neurobiology journals and they try to keep up with new findings, but at the end of the day, they have this concept a free will that's not made of anything that we understand in the material universe and somehow they're still sitting at a control panel inside our heads and unless there happens to be a crisis that occurs when they just happen to be in our free will bathroom and are distracted and oh no that one was out of our control an epileptic seizure a gene for Huntington's disease whatever oh no they're taking a nap at that point otherwise they're really at the helm this is medievalism this is counter to everything we know about science and you know the frontal cortex is a wonderful example. Frontal cortex, I wasted about 30 years of my laboratory life studying the wrong part of the brain that had to do with memory 
And it turns out I should have been studying the frontal cortex. It's so much more interesting. What does the frontal cortex do? It makes you do the right thing when that's the harder thing to do. It's the most recently evolved part of our brain. We've got more of it than any other species. And like in some ways, the most fascinating fact about the frontal cortex is it is not fully wired up until we're about 25 years old. That's crazy. That's ridiculous. The rest of your cortex is pretty much there by the time you're a three-year-old. Whoa, does the frontal cortex, is it a more complicated construction project than the rest of your brain, the rest of your cortex? Does it have neurons that you don't find elsewhere? Does it have neurotransmitters that are unique to it? Does it have wiring that takes 10 times longer to pull together? No, it's the exact same building blocks. Why does it take 25 years for it to wire up? Not because you need that long of a time to do that fancy of construction. It's because you need that long of a time to even begin to learn what counts as the right thing to do in your family, in your group, in your subculture, in your society. Every culture on earth says, yeah, yeah, it's bad to kill, but if you kill that kind of person, we're going to reward you. Every culture says, sex, hooray, but not that kind of sex. Every culture says you shouldn't lie. But in this circumstance, it's a wonderful thing to do. No, like no genes can specify the 25 years of learning you need to learn what are the hypocrisies, what are the rationalizations, what are the self-serving lies that work for your partic particular world. And the greatest example of how we are nothing more than the sum of our biology is to see all the ways in which biologically you have two people and they're in the exact same circumstance and there's a moment where they can do the right thing or the wrong thing and the wrong thing is going to do horrible damage that's going to have repercussions for lives forever after and that that critical juncture one of them does the right thing and one of them does the wrong thing and for you to invoke notions of free will or soul or self-control or discipline or temperament or character or Sunday morning sermons in church to invoke any of those is nonsense. Instead, you can go through a mechanistic biology that explains the previous second and the previous million years that occurred that made this person have a frontal cortex that was able to do the right thing and this other person who didn't in that circumstance. And to use notions of judgment or criminality or praise or blame is totally scientifically obsolete. We learned that that's not the case 200 years ago. All we've learned since then is the, the building blocks, the multisyllabic words to describe the particular details of why that biological event happened. Yeah, so I think this is an important question because we've already touched on this topic specifically and I guess that you also touched on it a little bit uh, on, in this last question. So uh, about behavioral flexibility or plasticity, isn't that also a trait that we and other animals, perhaps in lesser degrees, have evolved because we, are, we were exposed to certain uh, environmental factors, I, I mean to certain evolutionary forces? That, so what I'm trying to ask you is, behavioral flexibility is also a trait that we have because we evolved it as an adaptation because we, are, we were exposed to certain types of environments, right? And incredibly varied ones. And what we had to evolve was evolvability. Yeah. Uh, it had to be in our nature to not be too constrained by our nature. Here's like one of the greatest examples of it I can think of in terms of comparing humans to other primates. Okay, so standard sort of evolutionary theories and thinking about behavior, you look at social primates and basically they come in two social categories. You have the ones that are called tournament species. 
-hmm. In them, they live in big groups. Males are twice the size of females. Males are miserable and aggressive as hell. Females do most of the child care. There's huge amounts of sexual competition among males. There's virtually none among females. You see nothing resembling monogamy. You see a whole bunch of genetic traits that are commensurate with that. Lung capacity in the males of that species is going to be a lot bigger than in females. The average distance between the eyes is going to be different. They're highly sexually dimorphic. Males have been selected to be extremely different from females because they've been selected for totally different traits. Then you, and these are chimps, baboons, macaque monkeys, rhesus, most old world monkeys. Then you look at the pair bonding primates, they're monogamous. They pair bond for life. Males and females are the same size. There's hardly any aggression. There's a bunch of genetic diseases that they're mo more prone towards that you never see in tournament species. They, males, pay, give as much attention for child rearing as females do. This is sufficiently the case. These are, these are mostly New World primates, but also gibbons in Southeast Asia, all of that. So show me the skull of a male of a newly discovered primate species and show me the female and just looking at are there canine teeth really dramatically different in size or are they roughly the same size and I can tell you how often they mate and what the sperm count is likely to be for males and whether females are likely to cheat on the male who mated with it. It's that clear, like discover that one fact or any single other fact like that and you know their entire social system including their private sexual lives. So where are humans, what has evolution produced in us by every behavioral measure, by every anatomical measure, by every genetic measure you can look at, we're not a tournament species and we're not a pair bonding species, we're some way, somewhere halfway in between and we're incredibly variable because one individual behaviorally and anatomically and physiologically and genetically is much more of a pair bonder and another one is much more of a tournament species and this is obvious this is obvious to any poet or any divorce lawyer or anyone who has like studied anything about human heartbreak and complications and stuff we're confused we're halfway in between and this is the case with so much of this. This is the only thing you could see in a species this smart that's going to live in like hunter-gatherer Inuit societies in Greenland and live in Mormon societies in, you know, Utah and the United States and everything in between. We're a terribly confused species, restated. We have evolved to be very free from environmental and ecological and genetic constraints we've evolved our evolvability mm -hmm. okay so dr sapolsky i guess that we are reaching our time limit now so maybe it's better to end the interview here and then maybe somewhere in the future if it's possible uh, let's try to have a follow-up to this because i have other questions so uh, but before we go, uh, I mean, do you like to make, would you like to make reference to any places on the internet where people can find your work the easiest? Oh, I don't actually know. I'm terribly, I'm like, my, my kids have to barely show me how to log on to something. Um, I would say, say a good starting point is on YouTube, Stanford University, very nicely, posted this lecture series of mine that you refer to. Um, it's 30 lectures. It's called Human Behavioral Biology. And its organizing principle is, if you want to understand humans that are best and worst, blah, blah, blah etc., you got to learn the biology of one second ago and one hour ago and one year ago and one million years ago and everything in between. That's the organizing principle of the course as it looks at 
aggression and love and sexual behavior and parental behavior and schizophrenia and depression and religiosity and everything else, the particular version that is posted is now 10 years old. It's a class that I teach every other year. Um, and in fact, I just found out as of yesterday, I start teaching the class in about 20 days and I've got to learn how to do it all virtually because Stanford University just closed down its, its in-person classes. Here we are in the apocalypse, perhaps, or at the very least, professors having to figure out how to like lecture differently than they're accustomed to. Um, so the one up online, the 30 lectures, it's about 10 years old. 90% of the facts in there are still accurate. 99% of the ideas and there are still accurate. So if you want to start with that, the class is designed for non-scientists. Um, each time there's 400 people in there and with any luck, there's some literature majors and increasingly some law school students who are trying to make sense of human behavior. I don't know, you want to look at that, go, go check those out. Okay, so I will include that lecture series in the description box of the interview and also links to your work there so that people can go and check it out. And Dr. Sapolsky, thank you again for taking the time to come on the show and it was a real pleasure to have you on and I hope that somewhere in the future we are able to follow up with this conversation. Well, yes, let's do this further. Um, as you may have noticed, I love talking about every one of these subjects. It's all I think about. Um, that would be great, yes. So uh, keep healthy, <laughs> you and your listeners and everyone else on <laughs> this circumstance right now. Thank you. Okay, guys, thank you for watching this interview until the end. I've got a lot of new uh, supporters of the show recently. That's great. And for the, for the people out there who are watching or coming to my channel for the first time, uh, I've been doing a lot of interviews with academics and intellectuals from a variety of fields. And to keep the channel sustainable, I would really like to ask you to please pay a, vis a visit to my Patreon page and to consider making a pledge there, any amount you feel comfortable with. Uh, and if you prefer PayPal, there are also links to several monthly subscription systems and also a link for a one time or several times big donations if you want, whatever you prefer. Otherwise, and if you like what I'm doing, please share it, leave a like and hit the subscription button. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my patrons and PayPal supporters, the main ones, Karen Litzke, Anne Blanchett, Pererga Larsen, Lau Guerrero, Francis Ford, Hans Frederick Sunda, Jane Henninen, Ricardo Vladimiro, Craig Healy, Adam Kessel, Olaf Alex, Jonathan Wiesel, David Diaz, Anian Kata, Jacob Klinkby, Matthew Witt Whittingbird, Arno Wolf, Tim Hollacy, Henry Kalanias, John Connors, Paulina Barron, Philip Force Connolly, Dr. Jerry Mueller, Herbert Gintis, Rutger Voss, Bo Weingart, Rebecca Newberger Goldstein, Dan Demetrio, uh, Robert Windiger, Rui Nassio, Arthur Coe, Zup, Marco Neves, Max Belby, Colin Holbrook, Susan Pinker, Thomas Trumbull, Bernardo Seixas, Pablo Santurbano, Simon Columbus, Jorge Espinha, Phil Kavanagh, Corey Clark, Mark Blythe, my producers, Isar Webbe, Rosie, Jim Frank, Lucas Stafiniak, Ilewelin Osborne, Dr. Ian Gilligan, Sergio Codriano, Luis Caetano, and Matthew Lavender, and also my executive producer, Michel Ruzieski. Thank you for all.